Released by Spike Chunsoft in the year 2017 on the PlayStation 4 and Vita, Danganronpa V3 continues the series with a sequel that culminates all of the games, light novels, and anime so far. Directed by Shun Sasaki and written by series creator Kazutaka Kodaka, the focus was on expanding upon the horror visual novel franchise from a new perspective for the fans. For characters, an entirely new cast of heroes and antagonists are featured, and like before, social bonds can be built with characters during free time to add to collectibles and skills, while hidden items can again be hunted and collected. For gameplay, the game still utilizes the same visual novel style and paces itself with daily life, deadly life, and class trial segments, though a few gameplay additions have been added. The player can now perform perjury and lie as a tactic to coerce the truth from others. Debate scrums now occur when opinions split the group evenly in half, and arguments can be matched to counter-arguments in order to determine a proper order of events and persuade an entire group of opponents. Argument armaments now involve timing keywords to disarm the final arguments of the accused in a rhythm minigame. New logic minigames called Psyche Taxi and Mind Mine are introduced while Rebuttal Showdowns and Hangman's Gambit return. Otherwise, more side modes including the return of the dating sim alternate story are available though not needed for the story. The story only gets larger from here, so let's cut it down to size with a recapitation. The game begins with a student named Kaede stepping out of a locker with no knowledge of who she is and why she's there. At the same time, another student named Shuichi emerges from another locker, also dazed and confused. They both have a foggy memory of being kidnapped and brought here, but when they attempt to leave they are suddenly confronted by a mech suit that gives pursuit. Their path leads them to a room full of 14 other students, all equally confused about their surroundings. The mechs now enter and surround the students, introducing the mechs as powerful weapons called exosols, though the pilots soon leave their respective mechs and introduce themselves with a dynamic entry. Monotaro, Monosuke, Monofani, Monodom, and Monokid reveal themselves, calling themselves the Monocubs, and explaining they each lost their memories and have become different people because of an event called the Ultimate Hunt. They then state the first step from here is for them to regain their memory of who they are and what ultimate skill they possess before they begin the killing game. Magically changing them out of their normal clothes into their original ultimate clothes, they are all flashed with the light that sends their sealed memories flooding back to them. The game begins again with a student named Kaede stepping out of a locker with no memory of why she's there. At the same time, another student named Shuichi emerges from another locker, also dazed and confused. Suddenly, the Monocubs assemble into the room, see their first memories are restored, and welcome them to the Ultimate Academy for Gifted Juveniles. There are 16 total Ultimate students, including them, in this school, each scattered by the government per the Ultimate Initiative for their unique prodigious talent. After they leave without any other explanation, Shuichi reintroduces himself as the Ultimate Detective and Kaede as the Ultimate Pianist. They discover unique tablets on their persons already assigned to them and continue exploring around the school, encountering the 14 other students. Kibo the Robot, Kurumi the Maid, Rantaro who forgot his talent, Sumugi the Cosplayer, Gonta the Entomologist, Tenko the Aikido Master, Kokichi the Supreme Leader, Maki the Child Caregiver, Karekio the Anthropologist, Himiko the Magician, Angie the Artist, Ryoma the Tennis Pro, Miyu the Inventor, and Kaito the Astronaut. Finding the front door unlocked, they open it to find themselves outside but trapped inside a massive cage and wall with no way out. All the students are then called back to the gym for the opening ceremony, where the Monocubs announce that the 16 students are to play a killing game, and a strange asymmetrical bear named Monokuma introduces himself as the father of the Monocubs, god of this new world, and headmaster of the school. He explains that in order to leave the academy, one must kill someone and make it through a class trial. After the trial, the students vote, and if they vote correctly, only the culprit is punished. However, if they vote incorrectly, the culprit gets off free and everyone else is punished. Naturally, punishment means execution. The students are so shocked to be presented with such a scenario, as they have nothing to do with each other and have no intention to kill, that the entire scenario feels unreal, though they may be powerless against Monokuma. As they are sent the rules for the killing game, it's revealed the game will continue until there are only two students left, but Kaede persuades everyone to not participate in the game at all and focus on escaping together. Investigating yields no results, straining the remaining hope of everyone. The next day, Monokuma makes the announcement of presenting motivation to begin killing, calling it the first blood perk, in which there will be no trial for the first murder, so the first person to kill gets to leave scot-free. Enraged at his attempt to turn them against each other, Kaito lunges for Monokuma, but the Monokubs interrupt him with the attempt to punish him as an example. Summoning their exosols, the mech smashes through the wall, unexpectedly crushing Monokuma underfoot and embarrassing the Monokubs into leaving again. Bewildered at the turnabout, the students go their separate ways, though Shuichi shows Kaede a secret door he noticed earlier. 
The nature of the door has him suspect that someone else is cooperating with Monokuma, and he sets a small trap to test his hypothesis. The next day, Monokuma comes back, explaining yokai is why, and reveals an additional motive to keep the killing game going, in which there is now a two-day deadline for a murder, and if Noah is killed by then, then everyone dies. Tension fills the room as everyone goes their own way to reflect on the situation, though before leaving, Rantaro asks if anyone else has heard of the term Ultimate Hunt, though no one else recalls. Shuichi then reveals someone triggered a trap on the hidden door during the night, so someone is definitely a mole, and likely the mastermind behind this killing game. They think to set up a motion-activated camera to catch the mastermind, and wait until their trap triggers. When there is an hour left until the deadline, half of the students think to have a meeting to figure out how to combat Monokuma when the deadline hits. Suddenly, their hidden camera sensor goes off, and as they check the hidden door, they are shocked to find Rantaro dead on the floor. Monokuma and the Monokids come in to confirm the kill, and award a free release of whoever did it trial free, yet no one raises their hand. Amused by this, Monokuma decides to hold a trial after all, starting with allowing them to investigate his murder before the trial. They also take a look at the pictures, but they fail to reveal the mastermind as they had hoped. After the clues have been collected, Monokuma leads them to the Shrine of Judgment, the location beyond which they will hold the class trial. As they descend down, Kaede is focused on exposing the mastermind, though she encourages Shuichi to figure out the truth, no matter how painful it may be. As the trial progresses, there is an unsuccessful attempt at uncovering a true mastermind, and Kaede does her best to push Shuichi into breaking out of his shell and deduce the truth. As it turns out, when they were setting up the cameras to catch the mastermind, the killer identified a potential murder weapon as a heavy shot put ball. When staging the cameras, the killer modified one of the cameras so the flash would attract the attention of the victim, and with a Rube Goldberg device, the killer was able to know where the victim would be when they rolled a heavy shot put ball into the system that had it land on Rantaro's head, killing him instantly. Shocking to everyone there, the culprit behind the rhythmically timed murder was Kaede herself. However, Shuichi points out the motive was not to escape the death game or take Monokuma's offer, but to kill the mastermind and end the killing game, saving everyone. Grateful to be outed, Kaede thanks Shuichi for being more assertive like she wanted him to be, and wanted to give hope to everyone else, but regardless, she is guilty of this murder. As punishment, she is strung along to a final piano piece, and as her lifeless body hangs, Monodom shoves Monokun into the Iron Maiden cover, definitively crushing and impaling them both to the despair of everyone. They demand to know Monokuma's aim, but the bear dodges the questions, pointing out Rantaro was the only one with the right hunch to the truth, but now they'll have to work harder to find out, before leaving. Bitterly swallowing the recent events, the students leave, and as Shuichi mourns for Kaede his own way, he accepts her wishes to seek the truth and removes his cap as a means to keep looking forward. The next day, Gonta finds an unusual rock outside, and the Monocubs give the group a batch of familiar items to open new paths around the academy. They discover more research labs key to each of their talents, and a curious flashlight, which they examine together. Monokuma chimes in, it's a flashback light, which can treat memory loss, and in this case, restores some of their lost memory. Instantly, Shuichi recalls memories of him fleeing the ultimate hunt, and to escape being captured, agreed to volunteer to have his ultimate talent suppressed, so he could be a normal high school student. Oddly enough, so did everyone else, but they cannot recall exactly what the ultimate hunt was, and Monokuma reveals they will need to uncover more of their memories as they play the game. After investigating the sites of the academy and enjoying the academy pool, everyone is surprised to find a unique tablet called the Cub Pad that plays a personal motive for someone else of the group. They consider swapping tablets so everyone can have their personal motive, but the group is increasingly divided on working together. To brighten the mood, Himiko declares she will put on a magic show tomorrow and invite everyone though Kukichi makes a failed attempt to trick everyone into a public motive screening with all of the cub pads. He succeeds in tricking Gonta into rounding almost everyone up for an insect meet and greet, while Kokichi declares he will collect the cub pads from everyone's room. Fortunately, Kibo's robot recording function thwarts Kokichi's sabotage attempt. The next day, Himiko is nervous about a trick she is performing for the first time, which is an underwater escape trick, with live piranhas that will be released if not performed by a certain time. The crowd gets nervous about the stakes, as when the timer runs out, the piranhas are let loose and the curtain is pulled back. To everyone's shock, it's a bound Ryoma in the tank now, and he is devoured right before their eyes, though Himiko reappears after a successful trick, unaware of what just happened. The chime goes off now, indicating a body has been discovered, and Monokuma confirms this is a murder to be investigated. Maki distances herself from the investigation this time, and Himiko refuses to reveal the magician's trick, not to mention the forensic report only indicates the cause of death as drowning, with no other information, so the investigation is trickier. As they learn more, it comes out that not only was Ryoma the ultimate tennis pro, but he was also the ultimate prisoner too, as he was guilty of killing someone else before which ended his tennis career. 
As it turns out, the culprit first knocked out Ryoma, bound him, and drowned him in his own lab. Using tools from the lab and the pool, they moved the drowned body to the magic stage, separated the piranhas with a glass partition, and placed Ryoma's body in the empty partition. After that, the magic trick would take care of the rest, as the body would be gruesomely killed during Himiko's show, implicating her. The only one who could have served up such a meticulous and considerate plan was Kurumi. As they correctly deduce and vote for the culprit, they ask her for her motive to understand why she went so far as to murder. She reveals she ended up receiving her own motive video correctly from the start, and within, it's revealed that with her exceptional servitude and competence, she was asked to serve her country as the Prime Minister and improve the country while pretending to only be the secretary. With the prosperity of the country resting on her capable shoulders, the threat of an unprecedented crisis loomed overhead, but remains unnamed by Monokuma until she escaped. With the needs of the many weighed against the needs of the few, she made the obvious choice, though for why picking Ryoma as the victim, it was simply because he was the easiest target. She actually revealed to Ryoma, who had given up on life itself and volunteered to die before, her motive video, and he again volunteered to be sacrificed to save the nation. However, Kokichi acutely reveals that Ryoma gave up on life after seeing his motive video from Maki, as it turned out to be a blank and there was no one important in his life anymore. Everyone feels a pang of guilt for what was essentially an assisted suicide to help the future of the nation that they now just prevented. They consider sacrificing themselves to allow her to live, but Kaito reminds them all the purpose of life is to live, and no one's life is arbitrarily more valuable than another's. Kokichi then shrewdly points out Kurumi revealed all that she did in order to guilt them into that response, again to try to live, and he turns out to be correct. Dropping all dignity and declaring an intent to live, Kurumi makes a run for it, and as her punishment, she is given a rope of thorns to climb to escape, which she takes, through a gauntlet of saw blades that try to cleave her, which she evades, only to find a false exit at the end of her struggles. At the literal end of her rope, it snaps, and as she plunges, Monodon pushes Minosuke into her path, as she slams into the floor, crushing Minosuke and dying upon impact. Kokichi and Shuichi both know Kurumi said something strange before she died, and that is that she remembered the truth of her past only after seeing her video, as if it acted as a flashback light. As they leave the courtroom, it's already nighttime and the stars are out, though Gota points out he often stargazes, and somehow the stars in the sky are all wrong. The conniving Kokichi states one final observation, and that is the worst liar of the group isn't him, though he is a compulsive liar, and it's Maki about her true identity. He deduces correctly that Ryoma found out her true identity and leveraged that into forcing her to reveal his motive video to him. Maki moves to grab him by the throat, and Kokichi chuckles out that she won't kill him in front of everyone, dropping her real talent as the ultimate assassin. The next day, they all visit Maki's research lab to verify she actually is the ultimate assassin, and within, Monokuma appears with the Monocubs to give them more keys to access more parts of the academy. One is the research lab for Korekio, containing countless authentic anthropological relics, including a document he notes that will allow him to perform a seance that will allow him to talk to the dead. The tech-savvy Miyu services Kibo for all his robot needs, and they soon find a room that can create realistic virtual environments as well as houses another flashback light. They assemble to use it again, though Maki declines, stating people who learn of her talent always end up fearing, hating, and eventually trying to kill her. Shuichi then sees a scene in which all 16 of them are dead, after attempting a flee from a particular group. Curiously, everyone else has the same memory returned to them, and the next day there is an emergency assembly in the gym, though some people now seem curiously in line with Angie's beliefs and worship. There, the Monocubs present a resurrection ritual from the Necronomicon capable of bringing back only one of the four fallen students and have them rejoin the game. They are split in their belief of this being real, and at this time, Gonta brings up he took another look at the rock with the writing outside, and now there's more mysterious writing. Angie takes this as a sign from the dead to resurrect them, and takes the Necronomicon and invites Gonta to join the new student council. When asked, they explain that Angie gathered Himiko, Kibo, Tenko, and Sumugi together to form a new student council body with Angie as the president, who seek to end the killing game, though to the others, it seems like Angie is bringing more people to worship her god, Atua. After Shuichi spies on the student council in the locker room for research purposes, Kaito invites Maki to join Shuichi and himself for nighttime training push-ups, though the next day he feels too sick to continue as Shuichi spends some time getting to know Maki a little better, seeing she isn't so bad. The following day, Angie's student council causes a rift among the survivors, as she begins making new rules and regulations for the sake of peace, at the cost of everyone else's freedoms and choice. The Monocubs interject, presenting another flashback light, but Angie then seizes and destroys it, claiming no one needs any new memories because no one will be leaving for the outside world anymore. They leave, intent to use the resurrection ritual to bring back Rentaro, and as they leave, Shuichi notes Kaito looks even worse for wear. 
That night, Tengo approaches Shuichi and Maki, stating she's only playing along with Angie and joined the council to help Himiko, but pleads for them to stop Angie from performing the ritual. Shuichi does agree it's dangerous to go along with Monokuma's motive, and so they enter Angie's artist lab to find she already completed convincing wax effigies of the dead already. She sends them away and locks the door behind them, but when they return the next day, they are shocked to find Angie dead in her lab among the effigies. There is speculation that perhaps one of the effigies killed her, though the arrival of the Monocubs verifies this is still a murder. As they review the Monokuma file, the cause of death was a stab in the back of the neck, and Karekio points out his recent research into seances may reveal a way to speak to the dead, namely Angie. In order to rule out the occult possibility, they agreed to utilize an occult solution. As they prepare, Maki assists Shuichi in investigating until the time of the ritual. Tenko volunteers to be the medium that the spirit will enter for the ritual, as she wants what's best for Himiko and encourages her to be more honest with her feelings, be optimistic, and survive. For the ritual, Tenko is placed inside an iron cage and covered with a sheet, but during part of the ritual where it's pitch black, they hear an odd sound, and when the ritual fails, they pull back the sheet to discover Tenko dead within. The Monocubs enter to confirm this as another murder, and it turns out the cause of death is again a stab wound in the back of the neck. Monokuma rules that since this happened during the investigation of another murder, that this murder doesn't count and doesn't get its own trial, so whoever did it wasted their time. They don't have much time to investigate Tenko either before the trial time begins, and so they head to the trial room. During the trial, the final words of Tenko resonate with the normally lazy Himiko, and she boldly begins to assert herself going forward. Debating further, it turns out the culprit was planning to commit the murder during the seance all along, and was preparing the room for it by loosening floorboards to form a seesaw. While nearby on the same floor, Angie came by to retrieve a candle from the same room for her ritual, and reacting, the culprit knocked her out with a floorboard, carried her back to her lab, and stabbed her in the back of the neck to actually kill her. They set up an occult situation as a red herring, and made it seem like a locked room murder to further complicate it. They then coerced the group into the seance, and when Tenko volunteered, she had no idea she would be the victim. Staging a sickle above the crouched Tenko for the ritual, the culprit had everything set so when they stepped on a particular floorboard, the other end would swing up like a seesaw thrusting Tenko into the sickle, killing her in the darkness of the ritual where no one could witness and had a seemingly perfect alibi. The only one with the intelligence and cool head needed to pull off both seemingly supernatural murders from beyond the grave was Karekio. At a loss, the mask slips from Karekio's face and a feminine personality comes out, telling him it's over. Karekio declares his only regret was not creating 100 friends, and explaining further, he reveals he never killed in order to leave this place, rather, he did it all for his lover, revealing his incestuous relationship with his sister. His sister was unfortunately sickly and didn't really have friends, so after she died, he promised to find friends for his dead sister, and has thus killed almost 100 people to join her in the afterlife. He slips into his lipstick alter identity of his sister, which he explains is the soul of his sister that entered him during a seance and has remained ever since. He also mentions he only kills girls he feels are worthy of being his sister's friends, and would have eventually killed more of the girls here, and actually look forward to joining his sister in death now. With that, he is taken by Monokuma and boiled alive, during which Monodom throws himself into the fire, creating such fuel for the fire that Karekio literally melts from the heat. From this, Karekio's spirit is released, and is about to be blissfully reunited with his sister, until Monokuma comes in to banish his spirit, denying him alongside his sister. As they leave the classroom, Himiko openly mourns for her lost friends, crying herself to sleep, while to the side, Kaito conceals the fact that his illness is getting worse, to the point of coughing up blood. The next day, Gonto alerts them to more mysterious letters attempting to spell out a message, and the Monokubs arrive to get them more items to progress them through the academy, including a keycard said to be their next motive. He also gives them a flashback light, through which they now collectively remember meteorites and something called the Gopher Project. That night, Kaito and Maki continue to bond, as Maki even opens up and shares her past growing up in an orphanage, taking care of the kids there, and training as an assassin to provide for them. The next day, Miyu invites them all to the computer lab where she repaired the computer within that is able to create a virtual world they can link their consciousness to, and in a way, escape Monokuma's world. She points out she didn't make this machine, and Monokuma springs out to take the credit. He reveals he used the template of a virtual killing game to make the world, but Miyu insists she removed everything dangerous within it. Monokuma then mentions he hid a secret in the virtual world, which speaks to the secret of the outside world, and with that, the group reluctantly agrees to investigate the virtual world. Within, they find a mansion where chibi avatars of themselves can be controlled. While searching, they don't find anything, but instead hear a loud noise, and suddenly Miyu's avatar freezes. Hurrying to log out, they are immediately shocked to discover Miyu in a chair, dead. 
Even worse, the Monokuma file does not reveal too much outside of the time of death being while they were inside the simulation. After they check the computer logs and code changes, they quickly leave for the trial with few clues. As the trial progresses, Kokichi gets annoyed at Shuichi using deception to uncover the truth like he does and resolves to end the trial by simply revealing everything so no detective work can be done. He explains that he not only figured out Miyu was planning on killing in the simulator, he also worked together with Monokuma to place a killing motive in the simulator as well, and finally exposes Gonta as the killer. The debate picks up from there, as the group is forced to contest belief and emotions against logic. As it turns out, the culprit messed up logging into the virtual world to begin with, switching the cables that would control their memory and consciousness, which ended up causing the culprit to forget everything that happened in the virtual world and interfere with their personality. Afterwards, Miyu set up things to kill Kokichi in the virtual world and cover it up. She intentionally fed true and false information to everyone's side, but only the perpetual liar Kokichi saw through the lies and decided to use her plot against her and plot her murder instead and use a patsy to be the culprit. Miyu used the altered virtual rules she made for herself to split everyone up and log Kaito out, and when she moved to corner Kokichi, the culprit appeared behind her to strangle her. Since senses are transferred to the virtual world, the shock killed Miyu in the real world. They tossed her body aside to cover up the scene of the crime, and Kokichi would get away without dirtying his hands. The only person simple enough to have been set up to take such a mighty fall was Gonta. Gonta is confused and upset because the memory loss means he not only does not remember committing the crime, he also does not know why he would have anyway with no defense for himself. Yet he does believe in the group when they do conclude it was him. The group tragically votes for Gonta, the kind-hearted giant in their group who never wished to love anyone there. Monokuma then pulls up Alter Ego Gonta from the virtual world to explain, since those memories never left the simulation. AI Gonta reveals he wanted to save everyone, and inside, Kokichi found the secret Monokuma place that revealed a memory of the outside world and showed it to Gonta since he already knew what it was. Earlier, Kokichi learned the secret of the outside world, and then made a deal with Monokuma to use it as a killing motive inside the simulation. Once Gonta saw, Kokichi rationalized the best way Gonta could save everyone was by mercy killing all of them, as it would be a better fate. Falling into despair, Gonta resolved to be the one to bear the burden of saving everyone while they still didn't know. Kokichi then presents that everyone is wrong in this case for wanting to pursue the truth and suffer longer for what they believe, rather than face despair and end things quickly. As his punishment, Monokuma begins rapid firing robotic wasps into a stalwart and bound Gonta, while Monophony suddenly gives birth to the monstrous insect that kills both her and Monotaro and impales both Gonta and Alter Ego Gonta. Ending it, Monokuma finishes them all off with a stream of cleansing fire. Kokichi then howls with laughter, revealing he was lying about his intent to spare pain on everyone, as he is the ultimate supreme leader, and his malice and evil means that the more others suffer, the more he enjoys it, hence why he wants the game to keep going and will see it through to the end as its winner laughing all the way. Also, Kaito's health looks visibly worse, as he coughs up an alarming amount of blood. Finally, Kokichi reveals his intent to finally end the game, while also revealing he was the one to write down the mysterious message on a stone outside. The next day, a smaller group tries to put the events of yesterday behind them, as Monokuma presents them two keys, the last real key and the real last key. With one, they uncover Kaito's research lab, wherein they find a report on the Gopher Project, in which in response to the meteorites falling, humanity placed its hopes on boys and girls of exceptional talent. Maki points out the name reminds her of Noah's Ark, as the Ark was built from gopher wood. The second goes to a lab that does not open, and as Monokuma points out, that's because the related student, Rantaro, is dead. They also find the hangar where the exosols are stored, which also contains a hydraulic press and an advanced security system. Later, Kaito suggests now is the time to fight Monokuma directly, as the monocubs and the exosols are all gone now. Everyone else is tired of the killing game and agrees, and they set tonight as the night. Kokichi crashes the party, claiming he was planning on ending the killing game tonight too, presenting anti-electronic, anti-machine weapons that can either fight Monokuma, defeat the exosols, or even clear the underground tunnel of its traps. Choosing to use the weapons he brought against the tunnel, they clear the death road and find the door outside before them. Rejoicing, they open the door to freedom and are soon shocked to find a post-apocalyptic world undeniably before them. Kokichi now laughs at their reactions and begins revealing what he found out earlier with Gonta. Some time ago, the leaders of the world saw the extinction of the human race and the meteorites carrying a deadly virus that were coming, and so made the Gopher Project to salvage the human race. Sixteen boys and girls were chosen, but all initially refused to leave their families and lives behind, and chose to wipe their memories out in order to hide being ultimates. 
At the same time, another cult organization who embraced the end of days learned of the Gopher Project and sought to sabotage it by searching out the 16 students in what was called the Ultimate Hunt. In response, the Gopher Project faked the death of all 16 in order to protect them and continued the project as they loaded the students into an arc to escape death. In truth, the Ultimate Academy is actually a giant spaceship colony. Unfortunately, the leader of the cult organization trying to end the Gopher Project was one of the 16 students, and they prepared Monokuma on the ship to sabotage it into landing back on the ruined Earth instead of a new planet. The students were in cryosleep to wake up on the new planet, but instead wake up here on a dead Earth hundreds of years afterwards. Finally, he reveals the hidden mole the entire time to be himself. To prove this, he summons the Exosols to his sides, which were originally designed to protect the students from unknown threats. With this, he declares the killing game over, but beats down Kaito, stating someone so hot-blooded as him might be a problem. With that, everyone, even Shuichi, sinks into despair, not caring about living anymore. After a few days, Maki rouses them all to show them a flashback light presented in plain sight. Everyone is contemplating suicide at this point, but decide to use it to wrap up any loose ends. After more memories flood back, the way this all connects finally comes to light. Makoto, with the rest of Future Foundation, started the Gopher Project at Hope's Peak Academy and selected the 16 students from within the rebuilt school. More to the point, they were the only ones left as the mysterious virus brought by the meteorites devastated the world, and because they were immune is why they were selected. Kokichi was leading the remnants of despair out to crush all hope for humanity, and thus why he modeled a killing game after their former leader, Junko Anashima. Revitalized in their purpose, they refuse to give in to despair as the symbols of hope, and Maki declares a charge on rescuing Kaito from Kokichi. Making preparations, they move into the hangar where Kaito is being kept, only to stop before the horror of seeing Kaito's jacket hanging out of a bloody hydraulic press. Monokuma makes the announcement that a body has been discovered, and so the killing game continues, yet even Monokuma cannot identify or confirm the identity of the body. The investigation continues, and as they enter the class trial, it's unclear whether Kaito or Kokichi is the victim in the first place. In fact, during the trial, an Exosol presents itself at the trial as a suspect, but it's also unclear as to whether Kokichi or Kaito is within, as the person within switches between both personalities. As they work through what facts they know, this crime seems impossible to solve at first on purpose, as if to stump even a Monokuma. It all began when Kaito was imprisoned in the Exosol hangar after Kokichi declared himself the mastermind. Kibo then noticed Himiko smuggle a crossbow from Maki's lab over to the culprit. After some time, Maki made her way to the lab, intent to kill Kokichi and save Kaito herself, and took over an Exosol in order to enter the barrier to the hangar. The culprit then fired at Kokichi's arm to disable him in a non-lethal way, and while they were fighting, Maki approached in an Exosol, exited, and fired into Kokichi's back with a poison-tipped crossbow bolt. Maki then prepared to fire again to kill Kokichi, but to her surprise, the culprit jumped in to shield Kokichi, taking the poison bolt too. Not intending to kill the culprit, Maki ran to fetch the antidote, and while she was gone, Kokichi devised a way to defeat Monokuma, since he was only pretending to be the mastermind this whole time, and started by locking Maki out. When Maki returned, she gave the culprit the antidote, but Kokichi snatched it from him and pretended to drink it down. Defeated, she ran away, and Kokichi then proceeded with his plans. He used an electrobomb to disable Monokuma's cameras, and gave the antidote to the culprit, ensuring the culprit would now aid him in his plan. They staged the culprit getting crushed by the hydraulic press, when it was actually a clever camera work to swap out Kokichi and the culprit. Switching roles now, Kokichi was now the victim, and was crushed by the press and killed by the culprit before Maki's poison got to him, thus aiming to win the killing game even if he had to die to do so. Sabotaging the press now ensured the victim could not be identified even by Monokuma, and hidden in Nexusol where they remain even now. Clashing with his friends with honest bravado, the culprit is actually Kaito. The culprit refuses to exit the Exosol before the polling, pointing out that however the group votes, Monokuma cannot punish anyone if he gets it wrong, and thus the killing game will be defeated. Everyone, even Monokuma, chooses to have faith in Shuichi's deduction, and defeated, Kaito now exits the Exosol to end the game. Once the class votes for Kaito, it turns out to be correct due to Kaito's confession. When asked why, Kaito reveals Kokichi planned to pretend to be the mastermind and show them the outside world this whole time. That way the killing game would end, but the true mastermind still instigated events that spurred Maki to shoot a poison dart into him. Thinking back, Maki got the motive after they used the flashback light, and thus it was likely left by the true mastermind. The scheme then started for Kaito to kill Kokichi and then pretend to be dead, so if the group voted for Maki or Kokichi, Kaito would reveal himself, thus invalidating the entire trial since he wasn't a victim. 
Kokichi knew that Monokuma would not change the rules suddenly to be unfair in a mistrial, since he knew this whole game was being watched, and thus why the rules needed to be followed. He also admits his health has taken a turn for terminally worse, and the group thinks this is the deadly virus that afflicted the rest of the population before. He also points out that just because they didn't trick Monokuma after all, they still succeeded in rooting out the true mastermind. Coughing up more blood, Kaido knows the end is near, and Monokuma agrees, revealing a new set of Monokubs here, and pointing out it's useless to try and stop this killing game because they're all more replaceable than they know, which strikes Shuichi as awfully suspicious. Maki confesses her love for Kaito as she is prepared to fight Monokuma even now, but the cheerful Kaito talks her down and urges them all to stay positive, even without him now. In an oddly familiar execution, Kaito is strapped inside a shuttle and shooting off into space. However, Kaito's illness claims him right as he realizes his dream of reaching space as the ultimate astronaut, and the execution is declared a failure. Though the group still receives his dead body, Kibo is struck by some debris, and Monokuma is furious at the denial. Mentioning it means nothing, since the killing game will keep going on, he takes out another flashback light and uses it immediately, claiming this one has a special effect and there is only to spare from here. That night, the group gathers near Kaito's training spot to mourn their own way together, though elsewhere, Kibo is in his lab using the high-tech upgrades to overhaul himself into a deadly killing machine. Launching off, Kibo launches an all-out assault on the school, pausing to explain that destroying the academy is his solution for ending the killing games. Monokuma comes out, annoyed at Kibo, but points out his actions could never end the killing game because it is eternal. Thus, both robots clash with each other outside while everyone else flees from the battle inside. Thinking of what to do next, the idea of finding the mastermind comes up, as it's what Kaito and Kokichi died to try and expose. With Kibo distracting the Exosols, they think to keep exploring places they haven't tried before to find hope for themselves and the lurking remnant of despair. They find Kokichi's lab, though the battle has broken the door open, and within discover a book detailing the history of Hope's Peak Academy, namely the events from the first game, but Shuichi notes something within that contradicts all of their memories. The delayed effect of Monokuma's special flashback light now triggers, and Shuichi now recalls a conversation with a child during the preparation of the Gopher project. They investigate Kokichi's room now, finding he was onto something bigger, and leaving a trail of clues to another message like the one on the rock he wrote. Suddenly, another memory comes flooding back to Shuichi, and it's him discussing being part of the Gopher project. Kibo now helps them open Rantaro's lab, wherein they find a mysterious vault, where they use the clues from Kokichi to enter and learn he didn't write them originally, only modified them to make it seem like he did. Within, they find a video by Rantaro, but it's recorded in this room, but that's impossible since he died before they found this room. The video speaks of a previous killing game and reveals that because he won is why he earned the title Ultimate Survivor, and that he wanted this next killing game to happen. Another flashback hits Shuichi, detailing how he was encouraged to go on by his friends, and again when all 16 of them were about to enter cold sleep. After searching more, they finally confront the curious door in the library again, and after Kibo opens it, beyond they find a room fit for a remnant of despair, and a giant Monokuma head claiming the killing game is as unkillable as despair itself. This head, calling itself Mother Kuma, is the source creating new Monokumas, and as they check the room, they find evidence from the first trial, and another monopad belonging to Rantaro as his prize for winning the last game, containing a map of the entire academy, as well as a clue from his past self on how to end the killing game. Unfortunately, they don't find any major clues to the Mastermind, and instead have another memory of when they woke from Deep Freeze, and Monokuma greeted them and wiped out their memories in order to create a new killing game. Later, when they search more classrooms, they find one with a curious computer able to not only manufacture flashback lights, but also the memories within them, but from the optional memories to select, most are outright contradictory. Himiko then reveals a hidden room in the bathroom, just like the first killing game, that leads back to the hidden library room. With the clues in place, Shuichi is confident he has cracked the mastermind mystery, and ceases the fighting outside in order to call upon one last class trial. Monokuma agrees only on the terms that if Shuichi fails to reach his truth, then everyone will be punished. Before they begin, they bring along a strange device Kokichi devised and Miyu built that was made to suck up tiny bugs, and as Kibo's enhanced vision reveals, it's full of tiny flying Monokumas with cameras, collectively calling themselves Nanokuma, the sixth Monokub. Before the class trial begins, Shuichi renounces this is to be a retrial for the murder of Rantaro, as they found new evidence relevant to the case. If Monokuma's judgment was wrong, then the entire killing game can be considered invalid, and Monokuma accepts the challenge. As they re-examine the new evidence, they learn that when Kaede set up the trap to kill Rantaro, it actually failed. The mastermind, who was getting impatient at the time that no murders happened yet, was willing to give Kaede a hand, and use their own shot put to kill Rantaro and plant it at the scene. 
They then took Rantaro's custom monopad and left the scene through the hidden door to meet up with the rest of the survivors to later twist the truth in the class trial. The only person who could hide in plain sight like that and be the true mastermind was Samugi. Samugi refutes it's not her, but Junko and Ashima, controlling things from outside again just like all the other killing games. Not satisfying the group with that answer, Samugi then reveals herself to be Junko and Ashima, the 53rd, claiming to be a perfect reproduction of her. She also claims that when she heard of the Gopher Project, she thought that sabotaging it would be the perfect despair for humanity. Digging in, they uncover inconsistencies in the evidence found and their own memories, and conclude the flashback lights implant false memories. Monokuma confirms this, and Sumugi reveals all their memories in the flashback lights have been fake, even them being students at Hope's Peak Academy. Sumugi reveals she can cosplay as any of the Hope's Peak Academy students perfectly, but Shuichi remembers Sumugi can only cosplay as fictional characters, which leads him to the shocking revelation that everything Hope's Peak is actually fictional. Sumugi confirms this, restating that the great tragedy, Hope's Peak Academy, the killing games, everything that took place was just in a fictional world called Danganronpa. As overwhelming as it is, Danganronpa is just a fictional setting in this world they were made to think was real and they lived in it. The killings are real though, so in a way, it's all the ultimate real fiction. The real world outside is perfectly fine and what they thought they saw was just an elaborate set piece. At this time, Monokuma reveals the faces and social media of the real world outside, as this killing game has simply been a show for people to watch. As they are all shocked and confused, Samugi explains that because the outside world is so peaceful is why they need a killing game, as the bored populace craves such stimulating media. This killing game is watched and beloved by the whole world over, as the very logo of this game was revealed to be the title for the 53rd season. Originally, Danganronpa started as a few video games, but then claimed its own anime, and eventually became its own real fiction like what they're in. In a way, the real mastermind is really the outside world, as Samugi is part of Team Danganronpa, the crew producing a show. All of them are just fictional characters too within this universe, as their names, personalities, backstories, and even talents are all manufactured. Their talents are loosely matched to their real identities, but it's mostly a placebo effect. As further proof, she shows them their application videos, in which they were just normal high schoolers and hardcore fans begging to be selected for the next season of the show for mainly selfish and vain reasons. Everything they thought they knew or felt, even sacrifice or love, was all prescripted by Sumugi herself. In one fell swoop, the whole group is defeated, unable to deny the truth, and fight for the lie they are and live in. Stepping up, Kiba points out that the audience doesn't just want despair, but hope as well and since they're part real and part fictional, they can still fight for real hope. However, Sumugi points out Kibo has the unique function of being a surrogate for the audience, and whatever popular choice the audience makes is what he does. He's also the cameraman for the game, allowing the audience to view things from his perspective, and his role is to take the despair present in this fictional world and bring it to the real world. Refusing, Kibo points out that because the voice in his head tells him to believe in hope, then he will bring hope from this fictional world to the real world instead. Samugi then puts them up to a new vote, either herself or Kibo, to be punished and determine if hope or despair wins. If despair wins, the killing game ends because they know the truth and they can continue living their lives in this fictional world as their fictional characters. However, if hope wins, then the killing game continues and will end only until two students remain. Kibo then offers to sacrifice himself, and Maki volunteers as well, provided she gets to kill Samugi herself. Surprisingly, Shuichi then clashes with Kibo, rejecting this idea and pointing out that forcing Hope to overcome despair in the end is exactly what the audience expects and wants, and why the killing games continue. He then reveals this was Rantaro's secret, and that something like this likely happened before. Rantaro sacrificed himself, and the punishment for him was participating in the next killing game. Samugi will just produce the next season, Kibo will continue as the cameraman, and if things play out, Maki will be the ultimate survivor next time. Even if they're fictional people, the pain and sadness they feel now is real, so he opts to reject the world and its consumption of suffering as entertainment. Meaning, he abstains from voting, and rejects both the hope or despair endings the audience craves. Persuading Kibo to reject the hope the audience wants, he then asks Himiko and Maki to join him in abstaining and ruining the ending for everyone, even though they're threatened with death for not voting. Monokuma then attempts to reject the refusal to vote, and tries to force the group to keep playing the Truth minigames instead, but Shuichi is steadfast in non-participating and ruining the entertainment factor of the game. 
The audience then attempts to erase Kibo's personality in their internet rioting, but he attempts to hold on, telling the group to fight on before he's erased. Believing that fiction can change the world, they use Kibo as an outlet to fight the internet and overcome the rabid fandom demanding more killing games and convenient closure for existing plotlines. Samugi laughs, saying she'll also not vote, and claiming that if they're giving their lives to end the game, then she'll give hers to continue it. And since Kibo will be the only one that votes, Hope will win after all. As the polling begins and ends, it turns out that no sides voted in the end, and Shuichi explains this proves the outside world chose not to vote as well, and as the audience begins to leave, it's proof that fiction has changed reality. In this game with no survivors, they think to just end themselves on their own terms, and as a mass punishment, Kibo rearms himself and begins blowing up the school with everyone in it, as the ultimate cosplayer plays her role to the gruesome end and is crushed by the wreckage of her own creation. Satisfied with this, Kibo then chooses to self-destruct as he flies into the walls of the academy, shattering it with his explosion and revealing the outside real world. As the game and the game ends, and after the credits play out and the audience leaves, Shuichi, Himiko, and Maki all emerge from the wreckage somehow still alive, and Shuichi believes Kibo spared them because this lie becoming truth is what the audience wanted to happen. He also points out that even if they were fiction, Samugi mentioned they were all copies, so it's possible things like Hope's Peak, the remnants of Despair, and Ultimates are actual things in the outside world she based them off of. Not sure what's truth or fiction, as it doesn't really matter anymore. They venture out into the real world to see the results of their choice. Danganronpa V3 Killing Harmony has enjoyed the success of selling almost 400,000 copies worldwide.